It is now my pleasure to introduce David Twite, our speaker today from McDonnell and Owen Hardwood Lumber. McDonnell and Owen is a global supplier of hardwood lumber. It ships to 29 countries annually, as well as over 50 million board feet. It's grown from a few employees to 2018 sales that are gonna be danger close to $100 million with facilities in Wisconsin, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, salesmen in China, Vietnam, and Turkey. McDonald and Owen has been on the Inc. 5000 fastest growing company six times in the last five years, including the last five running. Only one tenth of 1% of the companies that are on that list are able to achieve that too. His wood is in the piano benches of Elton John, the Beach Boys in Chicago, the guitars of Brad Paisley, the band Perry, Peter Cetera, kitchens of Oprah, Shania Twain, and Tom Brady, and was the wood just recently in the final four. David is the co-founder of the Praise Radio Network, a chairman of the board and co-founder of Crossfire Ministries, the co-founder of Lacrosse Teen Challenge. He believes fervently that inspirational leadership has been a propellant to all of them and is here to share his message today. Please give a warm welcome to David Twight. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Derek. Wow, this is great. Well, welcome to the Pro Acid Rain Rally. No, that's not it. Sorry, sorry to mess you up like that. Uh, it's great to be here at Leading with Power. This is really one of the greatest events, in particular my own hometown. I want to tell you that I'm really honored to be here amongst some of you guys that really have been uh, mentors. And it's kind of funny, I see uh, Gary Rudy. Gary, you don't know, but one of my first jobs is working for Dayru Corporation. Uh, so just so you know that uh, good things start somewhere. And thanks for giving me a shot as a kid. Uh, several months ago, Tony asked me, he said, Dave, do you believe in free speech? I said, of course I believe in free speech. He said, would you come here and give one? So I, I'm here giving a free speech. Somebody said a, a talk should be a little bit like a mini skirt, right? It's uh, long enough to cover what you need to cover, but short enough to keep it interesting. So I hope that we'll do a little bit of a mini skirt today. Um, did you hear about this? That the number one fear, the number one fear for people, number one fear, ready? Public speaking. The number two is fear of death. Death is number two. This would mean if you went to a funeral, you'd be better off in the casket than doing the eulogy. So, uh, so I'm going to do something that really is fearful, especially amongst all you guys out here. Last year, I did one of these events, Leading with Powers in Wausau. And beforehand, I went up and talked to different people there, a guy in the back. And I said, uh, is this your first time here? He said, yeah. I said, you've been here before? He said, no, I've never been here before. I said, me neither. Me neither. And uh, I said, if this thing gets boring, I'm out of here. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm the speaker. <laughs> so you can't buy that kind of you know, comedic thing. That's, that's just absolutely true. Can I ask you a second, just to, to pause for a second, ask yourself this question. Are you inspired? Are you inspired? I need to confess to you today first before I start, when you hear all these things about a company, I'm going to share with you today, apart from what I'm going to share to you, the encounter of, of what has been most inspirational to me, and apart from that, I am a selfish man. I'm self-centered and self-absorbed. I'm insecure. Now that I got it out of the way, that's just true. But I had an encounter that was absolutely the key to me finding what has been transformational inspiration in my life. You know, we all crave inspiration, by the way. We all crave it. They say 70% of Americans feel unhappy or uninspired in their job. Seven out of 10, unhappy, uninspired in their job. 84% of employees polled are planning to get a new career sometime this year. They're at least planning it. They may not execute it, but they're planning it. The number one reason that people leave companies is because of uninspired leadership. They like their job, they just don't like the leaders. Did you know that an inspired workforce is two and a half times more productive than an uninspired workforce? Two and a half times. Uninspired workers, they're, they're actively disengaged in their work when you're uninspired. You're disengaged. And when we, as, as employers, you think, well, what I'll, what, maybe what I'll do is I'll give them a, a, a raise or a perk or put free soda in the break room. They're not looking for that. They're looking to be inspired. Something that, that moves them. 
Harvard Business Review said this, inspiring leadership stands out as the greatest factor in creating the highest level of employee engagement and commitment. It's what most effectively separates effective leaders from average and, at, and least effective leaders. It is the factor most subordinates identify when asked what they would like most to have in their leader, inspirational leadership. So what is inspiration? If you're going to talk about inspirational leadership in any capacity, you better define it correctly, by the way. Webster defines inspiration as, div as divine influence or action on a person. The word inspiration actually comes from a Latin noun, means to blow life upon. The Greeks had the word inspiration. It was actually the word that literally means, the word inspiration literally means God breathed. God breathed. That was the word when, the first, when God took the first man, Adam, and breathed life into him. He inspired him. They say when you die, when you lose life, you expire. But God breathed life. He inspired Adam. The Greeks also used the word inspiration when it would describe a sailboat. I have pictures of sailboats. A, a sail that was filled with wind was called inspired. Filled with wind, it was called inspired. I have pictures of sailboats in my office, one like this in my office. And I often have people come in. I had a banker from Barclays Bank, and, and I believe he was from Milwaukee, came in one day. He said, why do you have those sailboats on your wall? Are you a sailor? I said, no. I said, sailboats remind me. They're, they remind me things that are necessary to be inspirational. If it's God-breathed, it, it, it reminds me. And so I, I think if, if, to truly be inspirational in life, I think we need four things that we can get from a sailboat. We need a ready sail. We need a trade wind. We need a north star, and we need a firm ballast. We need a ready sail. When I say ready sail, it is a, it is a willingness of your life, of your heart, of your mind, to be impacted by something. That's the willing sail. If you just say, I'm good where I'm, I'm, I am, and I'm going to do things the way I've done, I'm not going to let anything really touch my life, I'm not going to let the wind blow in my life, you don't have a ready sail. Ready sail. We all have a heart that seeks some empowering, inspirational force beyond the tattered thread and fabric of our own life. That frail human cloth of our own life is not enough to really be inspirational. We need a trade wind. Trade wind. The trade wind, you could depend upon this trade wind. It would come across and mirrors would cross seas because of a trade wind. We need to harness some compelling, dependable, steady, prevailing divine force that inspires us and propels us. When sails are inspired, you'll find new power and new potential in new places. You also need a North Star, a North Star. You see, North Stars help you chart your course, and North Star is Polaris. If you know anything about the stars, Polaris doesn't move in the night sky. All stars revolve around Polaris. It's what navigators use because of its steadiness and dependability, how to navigate and find direction even in the darkest night. Do you have a North Star of guidance in your life? A point of light that gives you reliable direction? You also need a firm ballast. You know, at the bottom of that sailboat, there's this thing that goes down in the water, and it keeps the, the craft upright during turbulent times. You need some steadying, stabilizing, holding force within your life beyond your own craft of your own human life when the winds and storms, and if you're in business, which are very likely to come, in life they're likely to come, that can hold together and stabilize you, stabilize our character, steady our fears, and as leaders and leaders of our homes and leaders of business, it makes us steady and valiant and strong, even when the challenges hit, because they will. Do you know, I believe that you really can't inspire other people unless something first has inspired you. Okay? You can't inspire other people until something first inspires you. Uninspired people can't inspire. You can't convey something you don't possess yourself. I believe all of us are seeking this inspiration, this deeper, deeper, more meaningful purpose in life. All of mankind are seeking a meaningful purpose in life. 
Henry David Thoreau says, the mass of men live lives of what? Quiet desperation. We're all looking to be inspired. We're all looking for something to, to move the craft of our life, to awaken us to greater things and greater potential and greater purpose. Do you know, we think that it's seeking pleasure might be one thing that we think that's what inspires me. I'm going to go out and I'm going to get into my, my sport. I'm going to get into, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to be outdoors. That, that inspires me. It might motivate you, but it doesn't inspire you. It was Viktor Frankl, the renowned neurologist and psychologist, the Holocaust survivor, if you remember. He wrote, the chief desire of man is not pleasure, but meaning, meaning. He said man tends to distract himself with pleasure when your life is devoid of meaning. We have 101 things that we do to distract our life when our life really is devoid of real, genuine, deep meaning. Leo Tolstoy, if you read War and Peace, Leo Tolstoy sought so many things. He was on a quest in life to find this grand meaning and purpose in life. He thought that maybe this trade wind of his life would come when, when he would, uh, become, if he could become famous. And he, he became famous. He wrote War and Peace. He, man, he had friends and he had relationships. And for a little short while, this was great, but he had some deep gnawing something was wrong. Then he tried it through education and philosophy. He, he was with the thinkers of his day. And that always left him shallow. And then he thought it would be through fortune, and he made, assumed, uh, assumed a massive fortune, but he, something was still missing in Leo Tolstoy's life. And then he said, well, maybe it'll be through family. He has family and a bunch of kids, but, it, but later on in life, it, at the age of 50, he was on the brink of suicide. And he had one last gasp of breath. He turned to the things he saw the peasants doing. They had a faith that seemed to hold them together, even though they didn't have all those trappings that he thought was going to bring him his trade wind. And he wrote his last book. It was called The Confessions, little known book. He wrote about his faith journey. That was the key to him, his life. So what's your inspirational trade wind? Do you have one, your inspirational trade wind? Is it monetary goals? Is it music? Some people say, my music. It, it, it might comfort you, but it's not, it's not inspirational. We use it so loosely, that term. You see, there's a difference between inspiration and motivation. Some things motivate us, right? But inspiration is different. Inspiration compels you on the inside. It's a force you feel. It's a compulsion that happens on the inside that makes you do something because it's on the inside. It's organic. It's not on the outside. Motivation seeks to move you from the outside. Come on, it's a pep rally on the outside. Inspiration is not, if you're in business as a leader, it's not a technique. It's not a bunch of things you put on a wall. It's not a pattern, a memorized list of things that you tell your people, and then they'll just do better. It has to be written on the tablets of your heart. When it's written on the tablets of your heart, it's organic. Can you imagine if I said you're going to marry this woman, but you don't know anything about love, so I'm just going to give you all the right things to say and just repeat after me every day. Just say the right words. You're, that's going to be good enough for your wife? She's not looking for a pattern. She's not looking for a technique. She's looking to hear it from your heart that cathedral of your soul. That's, that's what motivation is. How could that possibly happen? You, you turn your phone off, but you have an eye watch. <laughs> so it's different. So just so you know up front, just so you're OK, some of you, that I'm going to talk about my faith because it's critical. If I left this out, it is, it's the missing link. I, you, I'd be a mystery. I could give you all the stuff you've already heard again and say, here are five things you could do, and you'll take them, write them in your notebook, and try to do them. But if you get this, I'm, I'm going to be really vulnerable. I'm going to tell you this is the key for me, for me personally. You can disagree with me. That's fine. But I'm going to tell you the absolute truth. See, my faith plays a vital, defining role in my life and how I lead. Absolutely vital role. You see, I, who I am is not defined by what I do. And as men, we like to define ourselves by what we do, right? So if I said to you, Bob, who is Michael Jordan? Your answer is? Basketball player. Basketball player. Wrong. That's what Michael Jordan does. That's not who he is. Do you see the difference? We're quickly, we want to define ourselves by what we do. Authentically living out my spiritual things that have happened in my life, this encounter with God in my life, have had a positive impact on my personal life and how I live in my home with my kids and my family, but also how I lead in my business. How does God harness a selfish man? How does God, har how does he, he comes in, he takes over. 
He builds his home in me. He changes me from the inside out. It's, it's organic. It's not plastic. A recent study conducted by the Gallup organization, the National Opinion Research Center, revealed that 78% of all Americans claim that they want to experience some form of spiritual growth. Of this group, half of them felt they were too busy with their careers to enjoy God or even give enough time to developing their spiritual lives. When polled about their workplace, it was found that when businesses provide a spiritually minded programs, they felt not only more calm and relaxed, but that in fact were more productive. Additionally, it was discovered that those who worked for Christian businesses organizations where spiritual values were encouraged, they were less fearful and more committed to their workplace, as well as more, slight, more less likely to compromise their values. It was underscored by Ian Mirtkoff, he's professor of USC School of Business. He said this, your spirituality, could be the ultimate business advantage. Ultimate business advantage. When I was young, I, I was looking for my trade wind. And I grew up in a church, and I was a religious guy. I believed in God, but that was like, that's important. I'm okay now. I got my, I got my life insurance and my Jesus insurance, so I'm, I'm going to live my life. But I was looking for something to fill. There was something missing. So I really thought it was going to be through finding success. And I, I grew up, I loved business. I was a little kid. I, w I was crazy. I, I, I remember um, I saw this newspaper ad for Grit newspaper. Remember Grit? Anybody remember Grit? It's in the back of comic books. And I'm like six years old. And I'm thinking, man, I could get that. I'll sign up. I think my mom helped me. I filled it out, sent it in. And they sent me like 100 Grit newspapers. I sold them all because when you're five or six years old, nobody says no to you, right? <laughs> That's why you guys buy a $20 can of popcorn from the Cub Scout kid, right? You don't want it. I, I like to tell them, can I give you, how much are you going to make on this? Four bucks? I'll give you five. I don't want a popcorn, right? I, but but I, I did this. I filled this out. I got 100 papers. And, and what I did, after I sold them, I didn't realize you were supposed to send the money in. So it was very lucrative. It was very lucrative. <laughs> Welcome to America. I remember a, 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 few years, a late, year or two later, I read in the newspaper, there was an article, there was a guy named Ralph Sherell. He was a director of publicity for Caesar's Palace. And they were talking about how they take all their playing cards and they cut a notch on the side. They said, we send all the extra playing cards to the boys overseas and uh, people that are doing fundraising uh, events. So I wrote them a note. Nat said, I'm having a fundraising event. It was me, right? And they sent me 100, 100, 100 of these. I think it was a, like maybe a freshman in high school. I sold playing cards for a dollar that cost me zero. That's a beautiful profit, by the way. <laughs> you, really, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I remember, I, I, remember um, I would sell shoes and clothes and rings. I mean, I loved business because business is like a fun little game, right? It's a game. It's a game you get to play with your friends. And there are trophies if you do good. And there are rewards. And it has rules and guidelines. If you stay in the lines, it's good. But, you know, you can press the lines. You might do a little bit better. And there's a way to keep score. And, you get better with practice. I loved business. In my, um, in my high school, I remember we, we, I was maybe a junior, and the seniors had the popcorn. Remember the popcorn machines? That, that's what they did. And they all, first, first I did the, the, uh, they did the dances. When I was a freshman in high school, I, I got on the AV department, so I had access to all the AV equipment. Then I said I want to be a station manager, work for the school radio station, so I had access to all the records at that time. <clears throat> and so what I did is I went to them, I said to all the student body presidents, you know, if you use the people that you're using now, you could lose money because they're going to want all their money. I'll split the profits with you so you're sure to win. Uh, it was beautiful because the guy who is now Mike Pellinger, who's now he's uh, um, he's the mayor of La Crescent. He said, "I want to help you. Can I go do that? All the stuff up front. I'll set it up and I'll do it." I said, "Sure, sure, absolutely. I don't do a blasted thing, and I'm taking hundreds of dollars away on a Friday night. Did nothing. I think America's a beautiful place, right? Then you could do this kind of stuff." Remember, I went to my high school guidance counselor. Remember um, people lining up, coming out, and one person came out and they said, oh, I should be a doctor. Another person said, I should be a lawyer. So I'm excited because he's, he's going to have my future planned out. I walked into my Mr. Kleppy in La Crescent, Minnesota. I walked into his office. He laughed at me. He said, Dwight, you're a salesman. Can I tell you how I, I took that? That was, a, that was a cut. It's like I'm going to sell matchbooks on the corner. I, like, I can't do any of those cool jobs. I'm going to be a salesman. But here's what I discovered later in life. Salespeople can make unlimited money if you work hard, right? If you put me on commission, and so I get this crazy job where they put me on commission selling lumber later on in my life just after college. I didn't know anything about it. But all I knew is the more I, I they said, I'll give you a percentage of what you sell. I said, is that unlimited? Yep. And I mean, I would go home at night, go to the library, look up people, and I would just 
bang on every door possible. I would make 50 calls a day. I, got, I became an expert at taking no for an answer. And I could get back in. And I found out if I knew the secretary's name, I could always get around her because I say, hi, Joan, how are you? And then they usually let you through. And by the early 20s, my goal, I'm gonna, I can see it. It's right out in front of me. And I remember I had one project. In fact, um, it was, John Splinter went with me on a Friday to, to Famous Dave's. And I get a phone call from a company that makes uh, fixtures for stores. And they asked me if I could do the, an order, which I quoted them on. And they said, can you do it in four weeks? I said, nope, nope, I can't. And I could do it in six, but not four. Six would be pushing it. And I hung up. And he said, what was that? I said, well, if I sell this, we'll make a million dollars. He said, I think you got something wrong. I said, no, I don't think I got anything wrong. They called me back again, same lunch. And they said, now, do you understand that you're turning down this? This is a big order. I said, I know, but I don't want to lie to you. Long story short, they gave the order. So at 20-some years old, man, if you get a million dollars, my cut was, remember, Percentage-wise, my cut was so big that my boss finally said, we're going to lower your percentage a little bit because I was taking more money home than he was as the owner. That doesn't go over well. And my, I, I wanted to be mad about that, but I just, I just couldn't, right? I couldn't. But there was something wrong. Oh, man, I, I, I got all this money, and I got married at 26, and I got a great wife. I live on a hill, and I got, a, I got cars that are really nice and, you know, country club and I could go anywhere I wanted to go and for my age I mean I had no debt it was like beautiful I was a Christian guy I mean I, I went to church I believed in God but there was something missing in my life there was just something missing and I thought man this is I was banking on this one see I just find uh, success as wealth that was the trade win influence respect all the toys, right? All the toys. You know, my father said, I was, you know, they try to keep me up with the Joneses. I didn't want to keep up with the Joneses. I want to be way ahead of them, right? Here, but here's what I discovered. When you try to impress your neighbors, here's what I discovered. Your neighbors don't care. Nobody cares. Nobody's laying awake looking, thinking about your stuff tonight when they lay their head on the pillow. Nobody's thinking grand thoughts. In fact, if you think about what you're doing to kill yourself, to impress people, like that. My dad said the definition of keeping up with the Joneses is spending money you don't have to buy things you don't need to impress people you don't like. Something was missing. 1993, I heard on the radio they had a thing called Promise Keepers. And I'm not one to go to one of these things. It was a men's event. It was a Christian event. And, I'm, and I'm, I mean, I got, I got six bucks worth of Jesus, so I think I'm pretty good, right? I got six bucks worth, and six bucks is all. I'm good. I'm good, right? I think I'll get to heaven, and I, I respect him. I, I'll go to his clubhouse on Sunday. But something was missing in my life, and something inside of me said I should go to this thing. And I don't know why, but I think there must be a God out there because I never would have gone. I went to this thing called Promise Keepers, and it was in Folsom Field in, in Boulder, Colorado. There were 50,000 men. And I remember when I got there, there, it was raining, and I remember looking out over the stadium, and all of a sudden, as the event is beginning, the clouds part. There were two rainbows that went over the stadium. If you don't know anything about God's word, a symbol for a promise is a rainbow. God said, Dave, unless you miss this, I bought two. <laughs> I bought two. And then 50,000 men stand up and, and start singing, rise up, O men of God. I started crying. Why am I, cry Why am I crying? Why am I crying? Dr. James Dobson came out, and Dr. James Dobson said two things that really began to change the course of my life. First, he said this. He said, at some point, the world will throw away your trophies. He said he went home from, uh, uh, for an event at his high school as he was older in life, and he had the track and field trophy and he, the fastest 400-yard, and they had a trophy case. He drove in, went to his school, in the dumpster was his trophy. Sooner or later, they're going to throw away your trophy because nobody cares. Boy, you'll kill yourself. Try to impress the world. Then he said something else. And this is what I say was a pivot point for me. He said this question. If you had five days to live, what would be important to you? That question will crystallize the most important things in your life. We usually don't stop and slow down and think about that. But if you could answer that question honestly, if you had five days to live, would it matter how much money you had? 
Would it matter what kind of house you lived in? Would it matter kind of what kind of car you drive? Would it really matter? I've never heard anybody with five days to live said, boy, I wish I could make one more sale. You never say that. What would matter to you, I think, would be, I want to know relationally, my family and my friends know that I love my kids. I want them to know that I love them. I want my wife to know that she's precious to me. I might want to apologize to some people that I've wronged. Stephen Covey calls it, Live with the end in mind. Even stinger, singer Tim McGraw, he says, you should live, like, live life like you were dying. He said, uh, I went skydiving, I went Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. I loved deeper and I spoke sweeter. I gave forgiveness. I've been denying. And he said, someday I hope you get the chance to live life like you were dying. We all ask ourselves, what are we killing ourselves to achieve? Because those things, I had a misaligned on my list. I thought that maybe if I found success, that would be the key. But you know, I could just tell you, I'll make a case for this. If you think success, if you think the goal in life is to impress people and see how much stuff you could amass, Credit Suisse did a study a number of years back, a white paper on highly successful people who sold their build business, big businesses. You know what the first phase is after you sell your business, if you're highly successful? First phase, depression. Depression. You know why? As men, you lose your identity because you've defined yourself by what you do instead of who you are. Tom Brady, if anybody should really have it going, it's Tom Brady. If I had the time, I'd show you a video because Tom says this in his own words. For a, how many Super Bowl rings? Ten times to the Pro Bowl, makes millions, millions of dollars, has a Victoria's Secrets model as a wife. You know, in the video, he says, I thought it'd be more than this. I thought it'd be better than this. It's a, if you look it up, it's, it's on a, a 60 Minutes episode. John Rockefeller said, I made millions, but they brought me no happiness. King Solomon in the Bible, he was the richest man. They say his worth is over $100 billion in today's money. And here's what he says, it's all vanity. All those things I was chasing, he said, are meaningless, simply a chasing after the wind. I had a great talk with Damien Miller, who's here, and, and uh, one time at a, at a graduation. And I said, man, how is it? And to be in the big leagues, all these people that have these things going on. And, and, and he said, um, this is sad. Uh, he said, um, can I tell you something? He said, it's like the land of Oz. It's like a facade. All these guys have all this stuff, but he, he looked behind him and, and saw all these broken marriages and broken homes and broken lives. Didn't bring happiness. Alexander the Great actually wept when there were no more worlds to conquer. Money and materialism and seeking for pleasure is simply the anesthetic that will deaden the pain of an empty life. That's an anesthetic. We use it as an anesthetic. You see, because it's not success we want. Get this. It's not success you want. You know what you want? Significance. I want to be significant. I want to be significant to my kids. I want to be significant to my employees. I want to be significant to my wife. Francis Chan says, our greatest fear should not be failure, but it should be succeeding in things of life that really don't matter. That should be your greatest fear. Succeeding in things that don't really matter. C.S. Lewis says, I, we, if, I, if, if we find ourselves with the desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is we were made for another world. It was shortly after that Promise Keepers event that I began to cry out to God, and I, here's what I said. I remember driving up my hill. I said, God, I think I have you as Savior of my sins, but I don't really have you in the center of my life. I'm in the center of my life. You're not really king of my life. I'm king of my own life. But God, if I'm going to do this Christian thing, here's the deal. I don't have a passion for this. I don't want to be one of those weird guys. You know, there are people that say, you know, that are jamming tracks and they got the weird t-shirt and they're always, they're always bugging you. I don't want to be that guy. So I don't want to be that guy. So I said, God, you have to give me a passion. I think for the first time, God says, finally, you're talking. There's a verse in the Bible that God says, come, let us reason together. I think for the first time he said, you talk to me a lot and give me your shopping list, but you've, this is the first time you were dead honest and, and come before me and you're asking me a real question. And you, I think you're really ready now. And I'm going to tell you, things began to change. Because I realized there were three things that I never found about, apart from letting God have a central role in my life. Three things, ready? Three things you'll never find. 
I never found peace that was lasting. I never found purpose that was deep and meaningful, transcendent. And I didn't find contentment. It was, I always needed something more. Augustine says our hearts are restless, like we said, until we find our rest in God. Our hearts are restless. And this is why some of you here, it's, it's interesting, that you, you've achieved some great things, but you always think there's something still missing. Augustine said your hearts are restless until you find your rest in God. Not in religion, not in a piece of religious real estate down the road where you stand up, sit down, throw money in a plate, but an encounter with their creator that, that, that knit this amazing structure together. Blaise Pascal says within the heart of man there is a God-shaped hole that only God himself can fill. William Shakespeare in Macbeth describes what life would be without God. Here's what he says. Life without God would be a story told by an idiot full of sound and fury, but devoid of meaning. Devoid of real deep, significant meaning. You're just traveling through life and you die. Even atheist Bertrand Russell, renowned atheist, says this, unless you assume of God, the question of life's purpose is meaningless meaningless. So my relation with God is my trade wind. It's my North Star. It's, 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 it's everything. It's changed me. And God's wired all of you for a purpose, by the way. You're not an accident. You're wired for a purpose. And some of you are good at what you do because God wired you that way. In the Bible, there's a guy named Beaziel. He was in charge of the temple, building the temple. It said God gifted him with a gift of craftsmanship. That's why he did it. David was a great warrior, not because he trained himself. He said, God trained my hands. He shaped and fashioned my hands for war. Some of you, God has given business acumen. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, he says, God gives some people the ability to produce wealth. I see my job as a vocation. Of the, your vocation, it's, 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 it's really a ministry. It's a calling. My business is a calling. You know the word vocation, what it means in Latin? Calling of God. Vocation. If you say you have a vocation, you're saying, I have a calling of God. Have you ever thought of your job as a calling? Michelangelo, when he paid the Sistine Chapel, said it was there. He was going to use his gift to worship God. That's what he did. The word for work in Hebrew is, if you transliterate it, it's the word avodah. Avodah is the same word for worship. Worship. That's how you do, because God wired you together. He's pleased to see how you can work it out in your life. You have this divine potential. And it's minute, we're in ministry. Sometimes we think we're not in ministry. We think that's for the professionals that get a check, the clergy down the street. But do you know, it wasn't until the 4th century, you Christian people, it wasn't until the 4th century, there was no, up until the 4th century, there was no difference between laity and clergy. No difference. Same, 4th century. Constantine, it changed. So you have a ministry. You're a minister. If God lives in you, if, that's, if you're living out your purpose, you have a ministry. It just happens to be lumber for me, right? It's, I'm an open demonstration of truth. So how does all this Jesus stuff, this encounter for life, I'm going to show you how it works. Let me see, in my business a little bit here, quick. Make sure. Way too many companies are really good at having the right words on the wall and in the handbook but if it's written on your heart it's organic and I think that people can't fully be inspired unless what you're trying to inspire them with is something that you really believe that you have a core conviction I think that the greatest enemy to inspirational leadership is pride in selfish people that really are you're here to serve me um, the hardest thing I think for people that have had some level of success is to get over yourself and to humble yourself. Um, I think that's where things really began to take off when I realized that um, there's something bigger that brought me to this party and I have a purpose that's bigger than me getting dollars. It's, it's touching lives. It's about building a community, right? Not just a community. It's building a healthy community of people who really like one another. When you come here, you really don't understand what type of culture you're really getting into. The past places that I've worked for, the stress outweighed the enjoyment. And coming here, the enjoyment outweighs the stress, which has made me happier as a whole. This place has just made me so much better in all aspects of my life. 
commitment we have to each other um, in the good times and the good commitment we have to each other in the times of, tri of trial. I remember it was the day before Thanksgiving that my dad um, was diagnosed with um, uh, stage four uh, pancreatic cancer. And it was Thanksgiving weekend that we were sitting at the hospital in Rochester at Mayo and in walks Dave Twight who went over an hour out of his way just that one way to come meet with us uh, and sat down with us in my dad's room. Uh, it, it's a holiday weekend and he was willing to set that aside to come walk with me and my family through this really hard time. And when my dad passed away 18 days later, David was able to step up in front of a packed out church to give testimony about the redemptive work that God has done in my dad's life. He used David mightily in that. It's been great to be a part of that with other people in our company over the years. You're just free to be you here. Every day, um, I take for granted what we do around here because it's normal to me. I spend time with each of my employees on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, and just those conversations about how the kids are doing in school and um, you know what you're doing on the weekend, that, that there's um, time taken out of your day. Um, that's how I've been led, and that's how I try to lead. What I appreciate most is the family aspect. People, they care about you, they ask about what's going on in your life. Open door policy that people just really feel like they can communicate and not be scared or ashamed of what they need to say. We had a friend commit suicide. And uh, Tammy reached out really well and really helped me through that experience. It was two years ago when I was diagnosed with cancer. Just out of the blue, um, a kind of blood cancer. and So I did chemo and radiation and um, I really appreciated working with a company that really cares for me. I mean, I tried to work every day or just about every day, but I have a nap chair in my office and I would just sleep all day at work. But it was just, just to be able to come to work and make it feel like I was trying to do something and have everybody care for me and, um, and pray for me. I never had to worry about f the finances of having to deal with cancer and all that stress of it and um, I'm just really thankful for that side of it. Just did they just loved me enough to just help me get better. I really appreciated that part of just being able to come to work while I was going through treatment. But when I worked out there at McDonald's and Arms, I was a homeless vet at the time because I done been in and out of the penitentiary. You know, I done did a lot of drugs, you know, and when I met Dave, I, I was at my end. I was sitting in the lunchroom one day and this guy came up to me and asked me how I was doing. You know, I didn't know who he was from Adam. You know, and then he introduced himself, said his name was Dave Twight, you know, and you know, this is his company, blah, 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 blah. He started talking to me about Jesus, you know, and one thing led to another. So I started going to church with Dave, you know. Just met this man, don't know him from Adam. My life started to change. You know, just by him being, you know, being inspirational to me. You know, my life started changing. And I don't know what it is that Dave twice seen in me, but he seen something in me. And the things that he said to me, you know, it, it brought me out of all of that. I had got a ticket prior to starting there, and I was going to do some jail time. And he says, well, he goes, I'm going to tell you what. He goes, I think I find you very a valuable worker and he goes I'd like to work with you well being in jail so he kept me on the whole time in jail but he says the first thing is he says I want you to do a little something for me I said what's that and he goes um, I'd like to have you do a Bible study if you don't mind while being in there and I thought well that was neat David Dwight was always a big inspiration to me always cared about me looked after me and always asked about my family McDonald and Owen is more than just a lumber company. It's a place of happiness and love. And they reach out and touch everybody there. They check up on me, and I appreciate that. And it makes, you know, I matter. You know, that's, that's the biggest thing that I get out of this here, is I matter. I haven't mattered up until, in my eyes, I haven't mattered up until I started here. 
It's just, I needed this place so bad. If you, if you bring just people in and they become employees, they're here until the better job comes along. If you create a, a community, a culture, a family of people that feel loved, respected, and inspired, um, they're chasing the same goals and, the, and the, the business seems to go on this trajectory. They're not there simply because they're paid to be there. They're there because they believe in the goal, they believe in their leadership, they trust their leaders, they feel safe around their leaders. That, that to me is, is financially, that will add more to a company's net worth is if you get inspired people, but I don't think you can inspire them if you don't have something inspirational inside of you. You saw the video, this is Clint. Um, Clint came to me, I knew Clint, um, he was in my Sunday school class, he was uh, sleeping in the back row all the time, had his hat pulled down, and I just knew he was in my world for a reason, and I liked him. And said, someday, someday Clint, I'm praying for you, someday I'd like you to go to Bible school. And I told him, you know, Torchborough School, they have these schools around the world, and I said, someday I'd love for you to work as, be part of Crossfire in lacrosse. Well, he kind of laughed, and it was about a year or two later. He's at a softball game. He said, guess where I'm going tomorrow? I'm going to Bible school. And he went off to Bible school, and God did some great things in his life. And he came back, and he said, can I, he, he said, um, can I do an internship? I said, I don't have an internship. He said, I'll work for free. I said, you are hired, my brother. <laughs> I said, no, I'll pay you, but come on. If you want it that bad, let's come on. He came on, and, and he told me very quickly that his dad, Bill, here's dad, Bill. Bill was an alcoholic. He said, I hate my dad. I hate my dad because every birthday party, my dad, if he, sh he either didn't show up or if he did show up, he'd wreck it. Holidays wrecked it. I hate my dad. And I got to meet Bill at Clint's college graduation. Bill was a truck driver, and, and, I, and I liked Bill because Bill was honest, and, and Bill and I made a connection, and, 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 I, and so it was Christmas time a few months later that Bill's in a, the Valley View Mall, and he's kind of depressed. It was right before Christmas time, and I said, Bill, what's going on? He said, my family's not going to do Christmas this year, meaning his mother and father. They're not going to give gifts. I guess I really won't have much of a Christmas because he said, you know, I've wrecked it with my family. I said, Bill, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, have you ever told your kids, your, your boys, your three boys, have you ever told them you love them? He goes, I buy stuff for him. I said, I didn't, uh, well, didn't ask you that. I said, have you ever told him that you love him? He said, I write country western songs. I put their name in it. I said, wrong answer. I said, Bill, to you, in your language, that means love, but they didn't hear it. Have you ever told them that you love him? And I asked Bill, if he had five days to live, what would be important to him? And I said, Bill, as a dad, you have magic inside of you, God-given magic that you can pour over your kids. And you're so tied up in your job, if you just would just grab them and say, you know what, if, do the hard thing. Tell them you love them. Look them in the eye. Give them a hug. Bill went away, and a few weeks later, we were at um, Famous Dave's. Every Friday, we go to Famous Dave's, Clint and I and a couple other guys. And here comes a truck as big as Texas, and big, big Texas Bill comes out of the truck and comes in, calls his kid out to the truck. Clint comes in 15, 20 minutes later. He'd been crying. So what, what happened? He said, my dad told me he loved me for the first time. And his dad's, I'm going to tell you, sometimes you didn't have it poured on you, so it's really hard to pour it out. But I will tell you, you will stand before a God whose eyes are like fire because you've been entrusted with people in your world, and you can pour that positive, inspirational, life-breathing force onto a kid. I love you. He'll heal you too. Healing. I ended up hiring Bill because he didn't like his job as a truck driver. I hired him as a truck driver, and he was good. He was really good. I mean, I, I'm, that was back before they had logs. I don't think he ever stopped. It was really good. And um, Bill would come in my office. We'd talk about God and what it meant in my life. And, and, and you know, started out that Bill said, I find God by just riding my horse out in the pasture. I said, no, that's not really biblically accurate. And so Bill and I made a connection. And we got to share what it means to have a relationship with Christ. And Bill ends up having an encounter with God that was real and meaningful and personal and transformational. And months later, Clint comes to my office and he said, I love my dad. I've learned to love my dad. I said, really? He goes, I also respect him because I see how hard he works. It was Bill who all of a sudden, as Clint said, I get a, Bill doesn't show up one day. And they said he went to Mayo Clinic. And so that's when I drove up to Mayo Clinic that day. And Bill's given five days to live. 
five days. Pancreatic cancer. I happened to walk in, and the three boys were there in the room. I said, would you mind if I came in? And I came in. I said, would you mind, guys? If, can I just pray for you guys? I held hands with Dad and him. He goes, can I do it? Bill said this. Now, remember Bill. Bill has screwed up. He, I mean, it's the ninth inning. There's two minutes on the clock. There's nobody on base. There's two outs. And Bill goes around the room pointing at each one of his boys. Says, Joshy, I love you. I love you. Man, I love you. Clint, I love you, man. I love you. These kids are just melting. I got to hold on to the magic. And Bill knocks it out of the park. And Bill outlasted five days. But this guy, Bill, you know what his last thing he did when he died? He sang Amazing Grace as he died. That's big. That's huge. Reggie, Reggie came out of prison, went to the vet's home up in Toma. He came to work for us as a temp, the guy on the right. And, and I walked in that break room, and he's kind of mean looking. And I'm thinking, oh, man, this guy's tough. He's big. I just saw him this morning. Angry looking. I said, hi, Reggie. I'm Dave Twite. I said, um, you know, uh, Reggie, it's great to have you here. I said, I, I don't know if you heard, but we're a Christian company that's different than a religious company. Do you know the difference between religious people and people that have an encounter with Christ is just organic, right? He goes, you know, I think my mom has that because she was an alcoholic and she stopped drinking and she said it was because of an encounter with Christ. I didn't really know what that means. I said, do you, I'd love to meet with you and you and I can connect and I'd love to show you what that means to me if you're interested. And he took me up on it. And, um, so he ends up having an encounter with Christ within a week or two later that he, uh, that he comes in my office and I said, would you mind if I called your mama? This mama that had this encounter because she was an alcoholic that claimed Jesus was the answer. And I called her. I said, hi, Mrs. Reggie. Praise the Lord. That's what she said. I said, uh, Mrs. Reggie, I got, R Reggie, Reggie, your son works for me and he's had an encounter in his life and he wants you to know that he's come to Jesus in his life. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. She goes, I have been praying for 14 years that someone would come into Reginald's world. Mr. White Toast Dave Twite shows up, right? How did God choose a selfish man? Because I admitted I was selfish. I needed Jesus. And the same Jesus that walked this earth gets to walk through my body and see the lost and the wounded. He seeks and saves lost people. And he get Reggie. So Reggie says, would you mind? I got a friend I want you to call. And that's Daniel Rawls. Daniel works at Toro. Would you mind talking to him? I said, I'd love to talk to him. Daniel. Daniel was on Kitchen Nightmares. If you ever look up Kitchen Nightmares, he's on Leela's Kitchen, the most watched episode. He's called the buzzard because he steals food at the end and gets fired. Okay? That's him. Okay? So I meet him at a Culver's in Sparta. Where's my Culver's Sparta people? There he is. And um, we said, I like him. He's totally a con man. He lived in the streets. He was homeless. He was an addict and he'd been through lots of things, trouble. And I just liked him. And so we hung out, and he came to Easter service with me because we'd started bringing him over to our house, and he went to Easter service shortly thereafter. And, uh, after, and I went up to him after the service. I said, Daniel Rawls, you're in my world for a reason. God has some unfinished business in your life. I don't know why I said that. I said that three times. I'm going, this is kind of weird. But I just I felt like I needed to say it. God has some unfinished business. That night, we go to a Chinese restaurant. Chinese restaurant, little kid comes out with a whole tray full of Chinese cookies. And I said, he pick, picks them. Now, I'm not recommending you do this. I said, Daniel, that's a message for you. He gets it. You know what the message said? It's time to finish some unfinished business. That next day, rap, rap, rap on my door. I said, Daniel, you're here in my office because you want to finish some unfinished business with God in your life. He said, I do. Daniel comes to Jesus. His mama was a pastor in California. He was the prodigal son that was never going to come around. And he did. To me, this is exciting. This is more exciting, more inspirational to me than selling lumber. I can show you this. He'll tell you the story just in case they have mine. What, what do you got for time? 53. Okay, I'm going to land this plane. Ready? Okay, these guys, these, these two brothers right here, Jason and Jim, and this is Anthony, um, they own a company called Horn Lumber in Chicago, Illinois. Dale, you might know Horn Lumber Chicago, a 100-year-old company. Well, the long story short is they were tanking the business. They owed me a quarter of a million dollars. And all of a sudden, I come in my office one day. Jason and Jim are in my office. Have you ever had one of those situations where they're in there with the hangdog look? And I didn't, I've never met them before. And uh, Tammy says, this is Jim and Jason. And I said, are you guys okay? You look sick. And they go, well, we're here because we can't pay you. Quarter million bucks, can't pay you. I said, do you, would you guys mind if I, I mean, this is going to sound weird to you guys. Would you okay if I prayed with you guys right now? 
Jim, who had who'd been in prison himself at one time, said, sure, Jason's not knowing where I'm going with this, right? And so we connected. Long story short is Jim and I became good friends. Jim came in my office. Jim, uh, I said, Jim, somehow I feel like I gotta do something. I'm gonna align ourselves with your company. We'll create a strategic alliance. I'm gonna put my lumber in there and I'll own it. I'll invoice it myself and I'll keep you alive and work them out of all their debt. Um, they had a terrible relationship with their mama who took over and would swear at them on a daily basis. They'd been beat to a pulp. And we went down in the last several months ago, bought the business, and I'm gonna sell it to the boys at my cost. Selfish people don't do that. I was there with them this day, just a few weeks ago, praying with all these guys, right? In their business. These are not churchgoers, right? For the first time, they saw Christianity that was real, that's not like in your face, like bony finger of indignation. And for some of you guys, maybe that's what religion's been to you. So here's the question. Business is like the game of Monopoly. Should have fun, should enjoy it. Collect all the stuff you get, get all the rents, have fun playing the game. But the greatest lesson at the end of the game is everything will go back in the box. Everything will go back in the box. Don't live your life for the game. This inspiration of this encounter with Christ was not simply going to a piece of religious real estate. It was realizing there's a creator out there that we all have been rebels. We're part of a rebel nation that started with a guy named Adam that said, you know what, I'm going to live my own life and I'm going to be God of my own world. And God gave you and I free will. So you could be indifferent. You could say today, too bad, Dave, I'm not into that. Good, God will let you. He won't strike you dead, but you will stand before him someday. But I want you to know something really exciting. He created you for a purpose. And you're going to wander through life trying to find that purpose in your stuff, in your business, in your pleasure, and you will be empty. You will live lives of quiet desperation. That's my personal testimony of what's happened in my world. So what does it mean to come to Christ? Is to realize there's a Jesus that died on a cross 2,000 years ago because as a sinner, I can't buy my way out. I'm guilty as charged. And Jesus on the cross took all of my sin and your sin, everything that we did wrong that would keep us out of a holy place called heaven, he put it on his back. And you know what he said? His last words? Teletelestai. It is finished. Teletelestai in Israel on the bottom of a receipt. You know what it means? Paid in full. On this cross, I will take the punishment that you deserve, put it on my account, punish me instead, and I will offer what I did as a gift to any willing recipient. And not only will I cleanse your life so that temple of your life is now suitable for a holy God to come and make his home inside of you and become the inspiration inside of you only by your invitation. How does that happen? I'm gonna, sorry, I'm going to get spiritual for one moment. I'll give you a verse. Ready? John 1.12. To as many as receive him, to those who believe on his name, he gives the right to become children of God. Receive and believe. In this room of North Americans, most of you are believers in God. Guess what? The devil believes in God. That's not salvation. It's the other word, receive. How do you receive Christ? How do you receive that gift? You look at what he did on the cross and you say, I want that applied to my account. It's an undeserved gift, by the way. You can't earn it. It's called grace. Grace is undeserved, unmerited favor. He offers it to you. It's offered to every one of you in this room. And he wants to give forgiveness, not, solely, not simply so someday he sees you in heaven. Come on up, see you later. So he can come and make his home inside of you, so he can live his life through you, and he can transform you. The word transformed, the Bible says you should be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here's the word transformed. It's the word metamorphosis. The caterpillar does not become a butterfly because it tries harder. A caterpillar becomes a butterfly because it has a miraculous encounter internally that happens when it dies to its old self in this little thing called a cocoon. And it breaks forward with this new capacity, a new power, a new splendor, a new ability. That's what it happens when God is, by your permission only, has an encounter with you. How do you receive Christ? 31 years ago, two words changed my life. I walked down an aisle. And I said, I do. I do. Do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, forsaking all others till death do you part? I do. I had to leave singlehood and be willing to say, I mean this. I'm not, I, I didn't say, I'll give it a whirl, I'll give it a try. There is a God that's pursuing you whether you like it or not. I prayed for every one of you here. This is the most intimidating thing I've ever done in my life because I know most of you. But it's the most beautiful experience because I believe that some of you, the wind is blowing today. 
The wind is blowing. There's a trade wind blowing. The wind of God is always blowing. Here's the question. Today, could you erect the sails? Could you say, God, I'm willing. God, I don't know anything about this, but I need an encounter. I need to know who you are. I need to know a, a God that's real. I don't need to know religious dead orthodoxy. I need to know something that's transformational. It's just receive him. Simple. You don't have to work for it. The, the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. How hard do you have to work for a gift? You don't work for a gift. You take a gift and say thank you. He did it. It's available. Take it and say thank you. So here's the question. Do you have willing sales? Do you have, have you found a trade wind, a meaningful, transformational, real trade wind? And when you find the trade wind, you'll find your North Star. That won't move. It'll guide you. I never, he never changes. Same yesterday, today, and forever. And you find the ballast that will take you through the challenges of life and give you strength that's beyond your own. Two choices, live on your own or let him come in. Guys, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you didn't hear nothing, that's because you weren't listening. Let me tell you a secret, man. None of you in this room are Dave Twight, except Dave Twight himself, okay? But you're exactly who you are supposed to be. You're in the spot that you're supposed to be in. You have the family and the business, and you're right where you're supposed to be. And if you're looking for the inspiration that David is talking about, okay, I'm going to challenge you all to go find it because it's out there and it's available. Talk to Dave. Reply to Tony at, uh, at leadingwithpower.org. Okay? Hit me an email, Derek at hardwoodlumber.net. Okay? Grab a guy and we'll explain it. Right? We'll talk about it. We'll help you understand. Okay, fantastic, Dave. Thank you so much for your words. Next month, we have Vince Miller, founder of Resolute and author of The Mentoring Mandate. Remember, bring a guy who's never been. Both eat free. Our gift to you guys. Get some new blood in here and back. On your way out, make sure you grab your bookmarks. There will be Jeff Bright and Mark Plan heading out for Valentine's Day, the couples event. Grab a flyer on your way out the door so you don't forget. Register at leadingwithpower.org. Anybody interested in the No Regrets Conference, see Mark Platt or firstfree.org. Thanks for coming, men. We'll see you back in February. There you go. Yeah, yeah. We'll let, we'll let this group disband. Yeah, that sounds good.